All right, Luke Acts for Beginners. This is lesson number 22, Paul's third missionary journey. We're going to cover um, Acts chapter 18, 23 to chapter 21, verse 14. <clears throat> so if you remember correctly, one of the last scenes that Luke describes is Paul's brief visit to Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey in Acts 18. Uh, the people there asked him to stay longer, but he didn't, promising that he would return at a, at a later date. This return would take place on his third missionary journey. So let's take a look at our outline. This is the outline that we're following. Note that this will be Paul's uh, final evangelistic trip before his arrest and imprisonment um, and uh, uh, confinement in, in, different, in different locales. So let's go to chapter 18, shall we, and begin reading. Chapter 18, verse 23, it says, And having spent some time there, he left and passed successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening the disciples. So we see here Paul's mission work strategy in uh, you know, starting each journey with a visit to congregations that he had planted in previous uh, locations and on previous um, mission trips in order to encourage and teach and strengthen. So he plants a church, he gets it going, he moves on, he goes back to his home congregation, he comes around on another uh, journey and he begins you know, each journey with a, a visit to existing uh, uh, congregations. So let's keep uh, going here. And we go to chapter uh, 18, 24, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So Apollos, a Jew who had been born outside of Judea in Alexandria, which was the great city in Egypt, had been uh, founded by Alexander the, uh, the, uh, Alexander the Great, the Greek uh, leader and conqueror. It had, been, uh, it had a uh, great university and a library and considered a place of high education and learning. So by mentioning that Apollos was from there, it's suggesting that this is where he was educated. Uh, he was a, uh, um, a teacher and orator. Uh, it was in this place that the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language. There came a time when less and less Jews were speaking Hebrew, more and more of them were speaking Greek uh, and, and uh, consequently could not read the scriptures in their original language. So there was a, a need for a translation into the Greek and that translation is called the Septuagint, calling it the Septuagint because there were 70 scholars that worked on that particular um, uh, translation. Uh, Luke describes Apollos uh, here, an important character, as eloquent. Not simply a, you know, a good talker, but a trained speaker, a trained debater. Uh, said he was mighty in the scriptures, well versed in the Bible and able to use his debating and speaking stills in the teaching of the scriptures. And of course, when he says he's mighty in the scriptures, they meant the Hebrew scriptures, the, the, the old, what we consider the Old Testament. Okay? Always interesting to note that they were proving that, that Jesus was the Christ using only the scriptures, of course, that they had at the time, the Hebrew scriptures. And also, uh, he wasn't fully trained. He had been taught about Jesus by some of the disciples of John the Baptist and thus was teaching effectively what John the Baptist had taught and that was that Jesus was the Messiah promised in the scriptures. He was teaching that effectively. The fact that Luke says that he only knew the baptism of John suggests that Apollos may have become a disciple of John receiving John's baptism, 
but was not aware of the complete ministry of Jesus that included His death and His resurrection and as well as His ascension, and also the great commission to the apostles to go preach the gospel and baptize all repentant believers in the name of, of Jesus. This may explain why after, you know, why after being taught more fully about the, the way, uh, the way, this is the, how Christianity was referred to early on as the way, uh, he was not rebaptized. He had received the baptism, the baptism of, of John. Just like the apostles, you ever notice the apostles, they weren't rebaptized. why? Well, because they had received the baptism of John, which was the baptism that they needed to have at the time when John was, uh, was uh, baptizing. And so they had fulfilled all righteousness in doing that. So Apollos was one of those. He was someone who had received the baptism of John while the baptism of John was required and, um, and in effect. He did not need to be rebaptized after the day of Pentecost. Now, the idea here is that all those who receive baptism before Pentecost Sunday, that includes all the apostles, the disciples of John the Baptist, the disciples of Jesus, if you wish, before his death and burial and resurrection, these people did not need to be rebaptized after Pentecost. How do we know that? No example, no teaching, not, not only in the Bible, but nowhere in history did anyone say, oh, and by the way, you know, hundreds and many, many people were rebaptized. No, that's how, we, that's how we know that. Those who received John's baptism, however, after Pentecost, they needed to be rebaptized according to Jesus' baptism, which began to be preached on Pentecost Sunday, and that's important because we're going we're to get to a part here where that plays a major factor. So Luke inserts this episode concerning Apollos because he was a high profile teacher and preacher. Some scholars believe that Apollos was the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. Again, that's just an opinion, but many people think he was certainly qualified to write this book. Um, but also because his short time in Ephesus sets up the next scene where Paul returns to the city of Ephesus to continue the work that he had begun there during his second missionary journey. So we see that Apollos receives the necessary instructions from Priscilla and Aquila. Another kind of interesting little story there. Note that Luke names the woman first. Priscilla is the woman, Aquila is the man. Note that Luke names the woman Priscilla first, indicating that she was the more able teacher of the two. This did not contradict Paul's instructions, you know, restricting women from teaching men in the, in the collective assembly when the church gathered, because this was a private matter, not taking place while the church gathered for public worship, you notice she didn't you know, begin to teach him while they were in the synagogue and while you know, in the middle of his thing. It says afterwards they took him aside privately and they taught him more perfectly. And you have to realize that the, the, the order that the names are mentioned, very important in the Bible. Remember when we started our study of Acts and when, when Paul and Barnabas went off on their, missionary, their first missionary journey, had John Mark with them. Notice they always mentioned Barnabas first. It was Barnabas and Paul and John Mark, why? Because Barnabas was the head guy. But after a while, after the first miracle attributed to Paul and they're moving on on their, on their missionary journey, Luke switches and now it's, it's always Paul and Barnabas. So those little things are important. So this is why you know, Priscilla and Aquila, she was the one that, that taught him. So armed with the complete gospel, we're speaking of Apollos here, armed with the complete gospel message, we see Apollos continue in ministry, but much more powerful and effective than before. So uh, we go to uh, the next section where Paul makes his way back to Ephesus, and we read in chapter 19, and now you'll see why it was important, this section on Apollos, when we begin reading in Acts chapter 19. It says, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? 
and they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. So wow, lots of stuff here that we need to unpack in these seven verses. A lot of people assume that these men were originally baptized by Apollos. I've heard that taught many times, but there's nothing in the, pas the passage that supports this. Nowhere does it say Apollos baptized these people. That's just an assumption that people make. The main difference between these men and Apollos was that he was mighty in the scriptures and they were not. They didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. The similarity was that they knew and had received the baptism of John, as had Apollos, and while he was at Ephesus, Apollos had not required them to be rebaptized. Now we can conclude, however, that they received John's baptism sometime after Pentecost, because after having taught them more completely about Christ and the Holy Spirit, what does Paul do? Well, he rebaptizes these people. So it's interesting to note two things here. One, Paul bases his question about the reception of the Holy Spirit on the kind of baptism they had. Think about that for a minute. He didn't say, so what kind of experience did you have? Or how did you feel when you were baptized? He didn't ask that. In connection with the Holy Spirit, there was no, he didn't say, how, did you feel powerful? Did you, did you have a special insight? He didn't say that. He's saying, what kind of baptism in connection with the Holy Spirit? What kind of baptism did you have? Did you receive the Spirit? We don't even know about the Spirit. So what's he talking about here when he's talking to them? What was he questioning them about? Well, here he's talking about the, what is it? The empowerment or the indwelling? Well, he's talking to them about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is given and received through Jesus' baptism, not John's baptism, right? What was John's baptism about? It was about preparation. It was about forgiveness of sins. But John never, never spoke about the Holy Spirit in connection with his own baptism. And then the second thing, Paul transfers what now? When he says he lays hands on them and they start speaking in tongues, what did he transfer onto them by the laying on of his hands? Well, he transferred the empowerment. This is a beautiful section here because it, it talks about very complicated things in a very simple fashion and it shows you the difference between both. He, re he says, if you received the Spirit, what baptism did you have? And they said, no, we never even heard about the Spirit. So obviously they hadn't heard about the baptism of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and the reception of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. They didn't know about that. So he rebaptizes them and then he lays hands on them and they receive empowerment. Be able to, and how do we know? Because it says they began speaking in tongues. They demonstrated that they were the recipients of the empowerment. So these then became the first legitimate converts in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19, we continue reading. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks, so we see again the familiar pattern of preaching to the Jews who reacted negatively and then Paul turning next to the Gentiles. Luke records that Paul spent a, um, a long time in Ephesus for him, two years, he didn't usually stay that long in any place. He was preaching exclusively to the Gentiles and he had success since Luke says that the gospel radiated out from this economic and political center to all parts of that Roman province, probably, probably through the various workers who were trained and sent out from this location to, to preach. 
Luke mentions that many miracles were performed by Paul and that God was using him in a mighty way to the point where some were trying to copy and use his name to produce similar miracles, but to no avail. Of course, these, this, this information is, is included in, in, you know, in the following passages, which we don't have time to read right away. The results of his ministry were not only seen in conversions and healings, but many who practiced the black arts of magic and the occult ended up piling up their books and burning their books, a true act of repentance that Luke describes in the in the other uh, verses of this uh, passage. And so uh, Paul, seeing his work in the church well established in this region, begins to make plans to revisit churches that he had planted in the region of Macedonia previously. Philippi and Thessalonica and the church at Berea. And of course the region of Achaia, uh, the church at Corinth, the church at Athens. He plans now to visit these churches before returning to Jerusalem and beginning a possible fourth missionary journey. This time he wanted to go to Rome. Remember, he wanted to go to Rome. He goes to the major cities of the re Ephesus, major city in the region. Corinth, major city in that region. And of course, in that day and time, I mean, you know, Rome. I mean, Rome was the capital of the world at that time. So he definitely wanted to go to Rome to, uh, to preach there. So he's contemplating these things when trouble springs up, not from the Jews who have been his usual opposition, but from the Gentiles in the region whose, uh, excuse me, in the region whose livelihood had been affected by his preaching and teaching of Christ. Remember, he's in a pagan area, he's teaching about Christ. That has impact, not only for those who believe, but it has an impact on those who disbelieve as well. And we, we learn about that as we read the section uh, or look at the section where uh, Luke describes the rioting that takes place in, uh, in Ephesus. So he goes to Ephesus, or he is in Ephesus. Ephesus, a great city of that region and time, it served as the major port of entry for Asia Minor, which is uh, modern day Turkey. Uh, there was a great boulevard, 70 feet wide. Of course, today that's not a big deal, but in those days to have a boulevard 70 feet wide was quite uh, amazing. Uh, that went through the entire city. Population at that time in Ephesus, about 300,000 people. Again, amazing for that time, such a large uh, population. Many streets were uh, lined with marble. They had public baths. The theater in, um, in Ephesus could hold 50,000 uh, spectators. Uh, the principal structure, of course, was the temple of the goddess Diana. Uh, also called Artemis in the Greek, uh, was located here. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In Greek mythology, Diana was described as the daughter of the gods Zeus and Leto, and she was the twin sister of Apollo. She was venerated as the goddess of the hunt, the goddess of wild animals, the wilderness, childbirth, the protector of young virgins. Around the temple area, there was a community that housed the artisans who earned a pretty good living making coins and statues, as, as you see in the diagram, in the picture here, earned a good living making these things uh, in honor of the goddess Diana. And these people were organized into a guild, or, or today we'd say a union, and they had considerable influence in a city like Ephesus where culture, religion, and politics all mixed together you know, uh, as a whole. So into this mix comes Paul, the apostle, who for two years preaches and teaches that there is only one God and it isn't Diana. <laughs> so, so, you know, so long as you're unsuccessful, nobody pays attention to you. But when you start succeeding, you know, that's when the knives come out, right? So it's the same thing here. He preaches that there's only one God and that worship and obedience to God is expressed by obeying and following only Jesus Christ. So part of the Christian lifestyle requires one to abandon worthless idols like Diana and give your life and resources to Jesus, not to the temple and all the religious trinkets that they sold. So there was bound to be trouble here. So I'm going to fast forward. We're going to go to 19 
and pick it up in verse 23. It says, about that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. Notice they're always calling it the way, meaning Christianity. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. So Luke describes the riot and the threats against uh, Paul that ensue with the crowd dragging some of his associates in the theater, shouting, confusion reigning. Finally, a city official quiets the crowd and warns them that they could be in trouble with their unlawful assembly. So the, I've only read the section where you, you know, the union guy uh, you know, stirs up the trouble and what follows is, is the riot. Uh, um, uh, where they, uh, the whole city gathers at you know, that, 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 uh, that uh, arena that I showed you there before, uh, they gathered there and uh, they were wanting to, uh, uh, to, harm, uh, to harm Paul. And then finally a, an official of the city tells them, look, we, we, you know, we don't have a permit for this, basically. We don't have a right to be here rioting and, and all this and we're, we're going to get into trouble if we, if we continue. And that calms the the crowd down. So this event here signals to Paul that it's time to leave the city and the work and move on uh, with his ministry. It doesn't mean he quits the ministry, but all of a sudden he's become a lightning rod that draws attention, negative attention to Christianity. And he feels you know, it's a better thing that I remove myself so that the disciples can quietly continue their, continue their work. So Paul goes to uh, Troas, the little map here, there's Troas at the top. Uh, Luke summarizes Paul's journey through Macedonia, encouraging the churches there and avoiding another Jewish plot to harm him and eventually finds his way to Troas, the place where he had received the vision that led him to the fruitful ministry in Macedonia. Remember Troas, he was there, saw the vision that said, come to Macedonia, we need help. So he goes back there Acts chapter 20, verse seven to 12. Again, we're going to move a little bit ahead here. It says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. A lot of people say, How do you, why do you have communion every Sunday? Because we read, not only here, but in many places, something like this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. It was a habit for them that on the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread, meaning to take the communion. Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered uh, together. And there was a young man named uh, Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep, and as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, and after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled, for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and they were greatly comforted. Always the joke when a preacher reads this, you think my sermon is long, he went till midnight. So Luke describes this miracle in such an ordinary way. That's the thing is, I mean, it says he was, the kid was dead. And Luke just says, you know, Paul went there and he laid on him and he, and he brought them back to life. He, he, he talks about this in an ordinary way. I mean, a 30 foot fall, is that enough to kill you? Uh, yeah, absolutely it's enough to, to kill you. And yet he brings the boy back with just a word. So Luke's skill is that he's able to describe in detail great spiritual events, but make them look natural and familiar and, uh, and real even though this took place in a culture and a time far removed from ours, we can still relate to the Bible study and the crowd, even the boy's sleepiness today. Sometimes, I won't, I won't mention names, but as I'm up there teaching or preaching, and I'm sure Marty is the same thing, we know who's asleep. 
I mean, you know, we can tell, we can see. So we just don't call out any names for now. Anyways, that, 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 that rule may change with time. <laughs> And so we move on here to Acts chapter 20, a little further on. Paul's farewell to um, the uh, elders or a farewell to the people in Ephesus. Luke uh, continues his meticulous accounting of Paul's movements by describing the details of Paul's trip from Ephesus through Macedonia back to Troas and now on to Miletus, a coastal city uh, south, of, uh, south of Ephesus. Now in Acts chapter 20, verse 16, we learn that Paul's goal is to be back in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, a journey that will bring him some suffering. But once he gets to Miletus, Paul summons the elders from Ephesus to come and meet with him. And he shares several important things with them. Another important section with a lot of uh, very, very uh, important information about, about the church. So let's pick it up in 20, verse um, 17. It says, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of grace of God, of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. So he starts with his personal situation. He begins by reviewing and confirming the basis of his ministry with them, which is the preaching of the gospel, which he declares he has done in full confidence, full confidence in all of its truth and power. He also reveals that the Lord is directing him to return to Jerusalem. If it was up to him, he'd stay in the field, planting and growing and, and, and helping churches. Uh, because you know, Jerusalem is Peter, is Peter and the other apostles, that's their area of ministry. He also reveals that trouble and imprisonment await him there. Paul then declares that this is a final farewell and he reminds them that he's preached the full gospel and he's confirmed it with his good life so that no one can blame him if they are lost and miss out on salvation. Don't use me as an excuse to fall away, he says. Don't, you can't use me as an excuse to say, ah, oh, all Christians are hypocrites and that teacher, well, he was, you know, he talked a good game, but he didn't, you know, he didn't walk the walk. He said, you can, don't use me in, in that way. I've given you the full gospel, and I've lived my life in such a way as to confirm what I have taught you. Then he uh, makes an admonition, an encouragement, direct, more, you know, more precise and more precise to certain individuals, and those would be the elders. He says, be on guard for yourselves. Yourselves here meaning the elders. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So Paul's comments on his personal work and conduct are not a, a boast 
they're an encouragement to these men on how they should act as leaders in the church. You, know, you see what I did? Now you do the same thing. That, that's that's the, the, the nub of what, of what he's saying. You see what I have done, how, have I, how I have acted? You act in the same way. In these verses, he gives them a warning to be careful and do their main job as elders, and that is protecting the church against false teachers and false teaching. Now it's interesting to see Paul use three different terms in reference to these men and their ministry. In verse 17, he refers to them as elders. In some of your translations, the word presbyter uh, you know, is seen. He refers to them as elders or presbyters. What does that word mean? Well, it means a mature man, a, an older man, someone with experience. Then in verse 28, he refers to these men as overseers. Another word for overseer is bishop. What does that word mean? Well, that, that word means guardian or leader. It refers to the position and the authority of that individual. Overseer, right? We, we have that in the church, but you have that even in business. Who's the overseer on this project? Who oversees the project? Well, the same idea here. And then in verse 28, he also refers to the same men as shepherds. Another word for shepherd, pastor. Okay. What does that mean? Well, that, that refers to the work itself. Caregiver, a, 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 a leader that, that provides care for a group. Now, the reason I mention this is that in the early church, all of these terms refer to the very same persons. And those were the people or the men who were charged with the leadership in the church. For example, uh, elder presbyter. This here denoted their age and their experience. The term overseer or bishop, this referred to their authority and their responsibilities. The term shepherd or pastor, this described their work and their ministry. Only much later did churches, contrary to the scriptures, appropriate these names to describe different positions of authority in the church. For example, a pastor or a priest referred to a local minister or evangelist, and a bishop was a man who was responsible for several congregations or a geographical area. With time, new titles were invented with even more power. You had archbishop, then you had cardinal, then you had pope, and so on and so forth. Today we have women as well as openly gay men and women who serve as bishops for various denominations. And that's a whole other book. <laughs> the question is always, how did we get there? Well, there's a way that you get there, but it's not subject for the lesson that we have this morning. As we see in the Bible, however, in the Bible, when we read about the, the, the construct of the church, we see that each congregation had its own elders, bishops, pastors, along with deacons and evangelists and preachers, and these people had leadership and responsibility for only one congregation, just one. This is why we call Brother Harold Weaver, for example, one of our elders. We could call him a pastor, we could call him a bishop, but all, those three words all refer to him. Well, not only him, all of, our, all of our elders, if you wish. And Mike Coghill, for example, we don't call him a pastor or an elder, no. Why? Because he's a minister, he's an evangelist, he's, he's not a youth pastor. In the, in, there's no such thing as a youth pastor, okay? And uh, Hal over here, Hal is a deacon, and I am a minister or a preacher, not a pastor, I'm, I'm a teacher, that's my my role in the church. So part of our effort here, and I, I kind of digress a little bit from, from the book of Acts, uh, part of our effort as a New Testament church is to restore the structure and the order of the church as it was designed and described in the New Testament. You know, if we were sitting there with a blank piece of paper and a hundred Christians, let's just say, and said, well, all right, let's organize this church. How do we organize it? Who's in charge? Who does what? Where do we get that information? Well, we get it from this. 
we find out that the leaders were called by different terms and these different terms simply referred to either their experience or their task or their role or their position, but it was always the same person. And in addition to this, there were men who served as deacons and others who served as teachers and so on and so forth. So this idea you know, of sticking to God's word is exactly what Paul encourages the Ephesian elders to do if they want to maintain the spiritual and biblical integrity of the church. In verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Luke finishes the chapter here with Paul's final encouragement to these elders to serve as he has served, not for financial gain, and be generous, he quotes Jesus here, in verse 35, he says, in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is a quote of Jesus not contained in the Gospels. Very interesting that he would quote this. So the scene here ends with an emotional goodbye as Luke notes that this will be the last time that these brethren will see Paul. So we move on to chapter 21 and Luke lightly sketches out the journey returning Paul to Jerusalem and the trouble that awaits him there. He uh, receives several warnings not to return but he's adamant in reaching the city as we read in the section that describes the final prophecy concerning what awaits him in Jerusalem. So let's read that section. He says, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre we arrived at Ptolemais and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hand of the Gentiles. And when we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we felt silent, remarking the will of the Lord be done. Notice that Luke includes himself in the group warning Paul. He says, we, where, where is it here in verse 14? And since he would not be persuaded, we felt silent. That includes Paul. That means Paul was there uh, watching uh, what was uh, taking, uh, what, uh, watching what was taking place. Uh, at that time. All right, so we're going to stop here as far as our textual uh, journey, if you wish, a good stopping point. I want to give you just a couple of uh, lessons that we can draw from this particular, uh, from this particular uh, section. Uh, lesson number one. Lesson number one, God lowers His servants no matter how great they are. My, my, my two lessons here have to do with Apollos. There are a lot of things I could talk about that we've covered, but I just want to draw a couple of lessons from Apollos and his experience. For Apollos to go higher in his service to God, this great man had to first go lower to receive what he lacked. There's a wonderful lesson there. Humility is a requirement for one who wants to minister effectively in the name of the Lord. You know, people are always saying, I wonder what my ministry is. I, I want to be effective for the Lord. I want to find you know, what I can do to serve and I want to serve effectively. And what should I learn? And what book should I study? All, all good questions. But before you, you crack open a book, before you take an online course, before you shadow maybe one of the deacons and find out how to serve, you know, this is a good lesson here. Before the Lord raises you up to serve Him effectively, he usually brings you down. That you learn, we learn something about humility. Because, I'll tell you something, ministry, 
will teach you humility in a hurry. <laughs> So you better be open to the idea that there may be some humbling experiences in line for you if you decide to go into ministry. And I don't just mean, quote, professional ministry. I'm leaving my job, I'm going to go and I'm going to study and I'm going to become a preacher or a missionary. Yes, that. But even if you decide to, you know, I want to get involved with people in the church and I want to serve, you know, be ready to be humbled because it's a humbling experience. All right, number two. And there are only two. Preach what you know because you'll never know everything. You know, Apollos lacked some important information about Jesus and the gospel, but he launched out nevertheless and God added what he needed in due time. My point here is that sometimes we use our lack of knowledge as an excuse to do nothing. Oh, I can't teach, oh, I couldn't teach a class. You know, oh, I couldn't get down there in the auditorium and start teaching a class. Well, you know what? Nobody's asking you to do that right now. But you might be able to teach someone else, your neighbor, your grandkid, whatever. You know stuff. I tell people, you'd be surprised how much you know. You get into a discussion with someone, a religious discussion, a Bible discussion, and you'd be surprised how much material, how much information you've absorbed over the years. Uh, up in Canada, I was you know, preaching and teaching up there and I had a class about you know, evangelizing the community and all that stuff. And some people were saying, well, I just don't know where to start. You know? Where do I start? I mean, 66 books, where do I start in Acts, Matthew? And I told them, start with your story. Start with your story. How did you become a Christian? What, what, you know, what, how did you? You were a kid in the church and you used to come to church and you went to VBS as a kid and later on at camp you became a, start there. You were an adult and you, you were married and you were a Christian and your wife was a Christian and she dragged you to church and one day the preacher said something that piqued your interest and you asked a question and you had a Bible study with him and, and then when he said such and such that really hit you and tell your story. You know your story. You're not embarrassed about your story. You won't forget any facts about your story. You can, you can answer any question about your story. Start with your story. I guarantee you that will lead naturally to other things. So preach what you know, because you'll never know anything. All right, next week, our reading assignment, Acts 21, 15 to 23, 11. We're kind of, we're getting down to the end here. All right, thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next week.